The Titans take on the Miami Dolphins on Monday Night Football. Last time that happened, we had what was probably Will Levis's best performance. Will we see something similar this week? We're going to preview this matchup, matchups to watch, keys to victory, a great guest who covers the Dolphins. This is the Music City Audible. Let's get to it. Oh, welcome everyone to another episode of the Music City Audible podcast presented by Broadway Sports Media in partnership with 440 Sports. I'm Justin Graver. With me as always, Justin Mello. And thanks to everyone out there for sticking with us as the Titans are now looking to avoid an 0-4 start to the season. Justin, how's it going? Doing well, doing well. Quick note for our listeners, our viewers, you probably noticed my background looks a little less exciting uh, than it normally does. Just doing a little bit of home renovation in my home office. Uh, so I'm down here in the basement. You'll see me down here once in a while. Thankfully, we renovated the basement last year, but definitely the background not as exciting as you're used to seeing, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we'll try not to judge you too harshly for that, Justin. But uh, <laughs> let's get into this week of games looking at. First, let's just talk about where the Titans stand because we were pretty reactionary. I would say appropriately reactionary, but not a lot of time to sit down digest the game analyze what happened more reacting to what we saw on the field last sunday but where are you at with the titans right now sitting at zero and three are you still feeling as down on the team as you were a few days ago do you think they have a chance to make something of a success of this season even if that doesn't mean playoffs keeping in mind that teams who have started zero and three since the 1990 season have made the playoffs just 2.5 percent of the time four teams that started 0 and 3 went on to make the playoffs since 1990. No teams that started 0 and 3 have made the playoffs since the NFL expanded the playoff format to seven teams making the playoffs. So, where are you at overall? Big picture view of the Titans, and then we'll get into this game. Yeah, first off, I want to apologize, to be honest, about the last episode, the Packers reaction, you know, and it's funny, the numbers for that episode are really well. I think uh, they've done really well. I think people like a good hate watch. Uh, I think it's what we're learning, but uh, that's not what we're in it for. As you and I both know, we pride ourselves on handing out a good in-depth analysis. And I don't think we did that after the Packers lost, to be totally honest with you. Right? I think we were both frustrated, reactionary, all that. So I apologize. We are going to try to do better. That's it. Now, unless they go out there and lose 60 nothing to the Dolphins, then you can come join us for another good hate watch. But no, all kidding aside, <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know where I'm at, to be totally blunt, because – uh, you know, no way around it. 0-3 is very disappointing. Uh, I, I think there are things you can say to say. I hate that sentence, but there are things you can say to say. Um, maybe you're not shocked. You know, there, yes, it's a first-time head coach and a first-time play caller and a first-time offensive coordinator and a first-time defensive coordinator and a quarterback coming off what was, I believe, his 12th career start and there are all these things and the offensive line. I don't think a lot of people realize youngest unit in the league. Right. So if you want to be positive, you're going to say those things. Um, if you want to be negative, you're going to say, you know, I'm concerned with some of the things Levis has shown. I don't know if they're fixable. Uh, he's got one of the highest, you know, pressure to sack rate in the NFL. I, I think we've all done a pretty good job. Lots of folks breaking down the all 22 on Titans Twitter, to prove that he doesn't always do a good job navigating pressure. And, and that's my same assessment when I watch the all 22. In fact, sometimes he drifts himself into pressure, right? Like, and so I've got questions and concerns about the pocket presence and the pocket awareness, the pocket maneuver uh, ability to maneuver the pocket, if you will. And I don't know that those are things that are that fixable. Sometimes I, I view those traits as you have them or you don't. So you know, I, I think there's two sides to this coin. There's reason for optimism to say, hey, you know, this is a young team figuring it out. It's a young coach. It's a really young offensive line. I think there are reasons to be to be negative as well. I wrote an article. Uh, I don't know if it'll, it'll be out Thursday morning. Um, Titans have the 12th highest explosive uh, play rate in the NFL offensively. That is high. They're higher than some of the better teams in the league. Now that's a moral victory and there's, you know, you got to start stacking real victories instead of moral ones. But what that tells me, and I've been consistent with this. I, I like this Brian Callahan offense. I do. I, I have no qualms over the way it's being designed. I have no qualms over the play calling my issues with the execution. All right. And, I, yeah. and that's on the players. And I imagine Callahan feels the same way when you're making the mistakes that Will Levis has made, when you're giving up as much pressure as the offensive line has given up. Even the receivers, they're creating. I, I looked at next gen stats earlier today. They're all creating above average separation, like league wide with league wide averages 2.96. 
they're all they're all way above that mark when it comes to creating separation. So I see the vision for the offense. I'm just uh, I think the biggest issue is execution. Yes, they are creating separation well. However, if you look at a guy like Traylon Burks, he has the lowest catch point and yards after catch grade in the entire league. So Traylon Burks, bad at the catch point, bad with the ball in his hands. I think to me, and this is not the topic I thought we were getting into, but I'll just say this quickly. So we're going to move past it quickly, but Traylon Burks needs to get less snaps. They just, they need to give up on the Traylon Burks experiment. He's not a downfield threat. He's not a yak threat. He's not a reverse, you know, gadget player threat. He is a worthless player in this offense. I'm sorry to be so blunt, but that's just where we're at with Traylon Burks right now. On the flip side, Calvin Ridley is actually the second best separator in the league is raw PFF separation grade. Second highest of any player in the league. The only player higher is Chris Olave. So Calvin Ridley, to your point, is doing a great job getting open. DeAndre Hopkins looked a lot more like himself last week. Seven catches, led the team in catches and yards. So those are all positives. And I think the biggest positive, the one thing, if you want to take anything positive out of week three, it's that the Titans actually... There's this uh, chart that goes around basically every week, and it's they call it the did we really get beat that bad chart, and it's looking at net success rate. So the percentage of plays that generate a positive EPA. The Titans had the best differential between net success rate and game outcome, right? So obviously the Titans got blown out. They lost 30 to 14, but they actually had a success rate close to 10% better than what the Packers had. You just have these extremely high EPA plays like a pick six, a lost fumble that Levitt that were, you know, Levitt that happened to Levis. Those things changed the outcome, the course of the game. But in terms of a percent of play success rate, the Titans were actually much better than the Packers, which can be encouraging if you think that like, wow, we just eliminate those few bad plays. The Titans could have won this game or it could be extremely discouraging because you have an extremely high success rate overall for the game, but you still lose 30 to 14. That could be discouraging. So that's sort of where we're at with the team sitting here heading into week four. I think we should move on this, move this discussion on to week four and talk about the number one topic to me before we get into keys of the game, before we get into matchups to watch is Will Levis. Is this a make or break game for Will Levis? Because we talked about it on the last pod on the recap that it could be time for Callahan to start at least thinking about putting Mason Rudolph into this lineup and see if things change. You saw how different the Panthers offense looked just by putting Andy Dalton in instead of Bryce Young. It looked like a completely new team. It could potentially invigorate both sides of the ball if it gives the defense confidence that like, oh, the offense is actually going to back us up and do something they're going to maybe play a little bit better. At least that's what happened. It seemed like with the Panthers. Um, so I don't know if they truly believe that all the players after the game reinforced the idea that Levis is their quarterback and they believe in him. But I do wonder if this is a make or break game for Will Levis. Before you answer that question, Justin, let's remind everyone, if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel. Give this video a thumbs up, like, turn on channel alerts to get a notification every time we drop a new video. And this episode is brought to you by Sinkers Beverages in East Nashville and Bluegrass Beverages in Hendersonville. More on Sinkers Beverages in a bit when we get to our segment, I'll Drink to That. But Justin, make or break game for Will Levis. Is it too early to say something that bold? Or where are you? If he plays poorly again in week four, if he has another backbreaking turnover in week four, do you start to think about Mason Rudolph post by? So I want to be clear with where I'm at on this. I, I thought we were clear last week, but maybe we weren't based on some of the comments we got on the YouTube channel. Um, I think you want to see Will Levis for a 17 game sample size this year, right? This is going to be his 13th start. And uh, he's still a young quarterback. He's still obviously figuring out some of these things that maybe you hoped he would have had figured out by now, especially the back-breaking turnovers. But I'm interested in seeing Will Levis for a 17-game season, right? Be simply because do I think Mason Rudolph can come in and play better football for this team right now? Absolutely, I do. And you're silly if you think otherwise, based on how Will Levis is playing right now. It just doesn't do nothing for me for the long-term future of this team. Right, Either Will Levis is the answer or he isn't. Mason Rudolph's not a long-term answer. Right? Mason Rudolph might be the answer for the next three months, and they might win more ball games than they will uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Will Levis at the helm. But it doesn't do nothing for me. It does nothing for – and it doesn't do nothing for them next year. So my interest is in seeing Will Levis for all 17 games, seeing if he can grow. With that said, what I was trying to articulate last week, and I, I think I did – is that I wouldn't be shocked if they feel differently and they make the decision to go 
uh, uh, to Mason Rudolph. Now, these guys, you know, Callahan, they're not on a short leash. They're not worried about their jobs, but neither is Dave Canales in Carolina. Right. That decision came down. To, I mean, Dave Tepper's a little nuts, but I think that decision came down to reviewing the tape and saying, hey, this quarterback is actively hurting us. And we think if we put the other one in, we're going to be more successful and win ball games. because Brian Callahan, just like Dave Canales, they're not interested in tanking three weeks into the season. That's not the way this works. So I do see a realistic scenario where maybe they look at the tape and say, you know what? This guy's hurting us, which he very obviously has many times this year. We're going to put in a guy that we think gives us a better chance to win. Can I see that happening? Absolutely, yes. Am I actively rooting for it? No. I kind of am with you. Like I may be waffling a bit of from my stance from Sunday where I said I'm done. So I pretty much said I was done with Will Levis and I'd be okay seeing Mason Rudolph. I do think there's two ways to look at it. It's like you – because on the one hand, I do as a fan and then someone who covers the team, I want to evaluate Brian Callahan, the coach, and Brian Callahan's offense. And for that reason, I would like to see what this looks like with a different quarterback just to know what it looks like with a different quarterback. Is this on Will Levis or could somebody else come in and do better? But I also agree with your overall point that it's like it's not worth finding that out until we have a truly definitive answer on Will Levis until this offensive line has time to find itself and gel with the chemistry and see if they can start playing at a higher level to give Levis a better chance to succeed. Um, So that's sort of where I'm at. So is this a make or break game? I think it's too early for this to be a make or break game. I on if you'd asked me on Sunday, I would have said he just broke. That was the make or break. Green Bay, he broke it. It's broken. But now, after a few days of reflection, I've come around a little bit. So that's where we're at on Will Levis. He cannot have a backbreaking turnover in this game, though. Regardless of, like, I don't, that not necessarily he's going to get benched if he does. He might. But that just can't happen. It's like the one thing he can't do is cost the team points or gift the other team points. Cannot happen. That's the number one thing. That's all I care about seeing from him. I don't care if he goes two for 30 in this game. As long as he does not give points to the other team or take points off the board from his team. <laughs> and, you, and we've got to keep in mind that they're going into the week five bye after this one, right? So if he does play a terrible game, if he gives the Dolphins points like he's done in some of these other games, then yeah, you, the coaching staff might say, well, let's take that week to prepare Mason Rudolph. Right. Or they might say, let's take that week to really self-evaluate and for Will to self-evaluate himself and all that. Keep in mind, he did give the Dolphins points in that Monday night game last year, very early on, on a d- yeah. disgusting, broken up screen play, pick six, like basically in his own end zone, Carson Wentz style. Not that it, I don't know if that was necessarily his fault. It was sort of a great play by the defense and a bad play by the offensive line, but it did happen. So hopefully it doesn't happen again. All right, Justin, let's get into some of these matchups to watch this week. Why don't you just throw one at me? We're each going to give you one matchup to watch that we think is basically going to decide the game. What is your matchup to watch? Yeah, one that I think uh, was circulating Twitter already. It's Jeffrey Simmons and Tavondre Sweat versus Aaron Brewer. Obviously, Aaron Brewer, the starting center uh, for the Titans last year. For a number of years, they go out, replace him, spend more money to go get Lloyd Cushenberry. We know why they got rid of Brewer, right? Felt he was a little bit undersized, struggled in pass protection, struggled with those bigger-bodied linemen. Well, if that's your evaluation of them, then Jeffrey Simmons and Tavondre Sweat better do a good job getting pressure against them. Look, it's a good spot for Jeffrey Simmons. He's kind of struggled to generate consistent pressure in the passing game, although I'm a firm believer that he's been better than the numbers indicate. You watch the tape. He is wrecking plays. He's eating up blocks, freeing up his teammates. Denard Wilson was on the same page with me, said something very similar the other day, saying that's a bad man. And he's been good, and he has. But certainly you want to get him going. You're paying him lots of money to, 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 to do to, to fill up the stat sheet, if you will. And you'd like to think uh, an undersized Aaron Brewer is a good matchup for him. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And we actually heard Jeffrey Simmons talking about this in the locker room. Teron Davenport captured this video and tweeted it out. I'm going to play a little bit of what Simmons said on facing his former teammate and his confidence in Tavondre Sweat going up against Brewer as well. Uh, you know, he's a guy that you know, I feel good with um, how nose tackle lined up over him. Especially with his play strength, um, I kind of, like I said, I'm gonna be able to tell him a couple of things throughout the week that I, when I practice against Brew, that I saw him Brew, and that he, that we still see on film. So, um, but you know, Brew is one of the feisty players that we know. Um, that's made. That's the reason why he's still in this league. You know, he's good at what he does, and he's good at the type of offense they run. They run a lot of 
you know, the outside things, um, the outside runs, like the outside zones and the toss, toss cracks and stuff in that nature. And that's what he do best, trying to get on the outside, get, a, get to the linebacker and stuff in that nature. So get, get to the outside and get to the linebackers and stuff of that nature, Simmons said there. It's going to be on Simmons and Sweat essentially to lock up Brewer at the line of scrimmage for long enough that he can't make those climbs, that he can't get to the outside and set those edges. And the Titans edge defenders are also going to have to be setting the edge. So I like this matchup. If Simmons and Sweat can have a big game and and really destroy the interior of that uh, Dolphins offensive line, they're going to have a lot better shot to stop this offense that we don't even know who the quarterback's going to be. We're going to talk about this a little bit with our guest here coming up, but Skylar, obviously Tua Tungvaloa is on IR with the concussion issues. Skylar Thompson started last week for the Dol- for the against the Seahawks, left that game midway through. Tim Boyle came in. They signed Snoop Huntley off the Ravens practice squad last Tuesday. Mike McDaniel said that he might have played Snoop um, over Tim Boyle, but he went with Tim Boyle because Snoop just got there and they don't want to throw him into the fire after he had been preparing for like less than a week for that game in that offense. So Skylar Thompson took five sacks in the first half. Tim Boyle only took one sack when he came in, but five sacks is obviously a high number. The Seahawks have been d- generating pressure at a very high rate, so it could be a little bit of like a strength of the Seahawks versus a weakness of the Dolphins, but the Titans' weakness is generating pressure without blitzing right now. Can they take advantage of a weaker Dolphins offensive line? If Skylar Thompson is the quarterback, can they take advantage of a guy who is prone to taking more sacks than not? Um that's TBD, and I think Tavondre Sweat and Jeffrey Simmons will play a huge part in that. My matchup to watch is the rematch. The I, I don't know what what part this is, four or five. Legereus Sneed against Tyreek Hill. After last year when uh, Sneed went viral for burying Tyreek Hill with the press coverage, jammed his ass to Cancun or whatever what the quote was on that. Um, Legereus Sneed has almost always played well against Tyreek Hill. And obviously it's different with Tua out because you don't have a quarterback for the Dolphins that you necessarily feel confident can get the ball to Tyreek Hill. But Legereus Sneed, he's played pretty well for the Titans. I know his PFF grade is very, very low, and that's kind of a weird thing. But if you look at just like uh, his coverage, like how little separation he's giving up and how he's doing at the catch point, how he's doing as a tackler, he actually grades out really well. So I don't know why his PFF grade doesn't correspond with that. But obviously, if Legereus Need can more or less neutralize Tyreek Hill, that'll make whoever's quarterbacking for the Dolphins' job even tougher, which is already going to be tough. Um, so I'm looking forward to see if Sneed travels with Hill like he has in the past when he played for the Chiefs and how, how ineffective he can make Tyreek Hill in this game. Yeah, I mean, that's the matchup to watch, certainly, right? I'm glad you brought that up. I was going to bring it up, but I, I, I went with Simmons. Uh, yeah, the PFF grade is such BS, by the way. Like, I, I think they yeah. only grade guys on th- when they actually get throws in their direction. So it needs given mm. up like, well, like three catches on three throws in three games. So his, his PFF grade is low. He's been good for the Titans. I'm not buying into the fact that he hasn't. I'm excited for this matchup. Like you said, it, it, it takes a little bit of the oof out of it. It's a good thing for the Titans that they don't necessarily have a quarterback you think is going to be able to get the ball to Tyree Kill on those goal balls, right? 50, 60 yards down the field. So certainly because of the quarterback, I, I think the matchup favors luxurious Sneak. And there's actually a stat that backs that up. Next Gen Stats has the deep pass percentage for Tua Tungvaloa and Skylar Thompson. Tua was 12.9% deep passing percentage in it before he got injured. Skylar Thompson, in relief of Tua, is at 3.0%. So obviously not taking those chances down the field, not being nearly as aggressive. You wonder if that's the scheme and McDaniel's saying don't do that or if it's just the ability of Skylar Thompson to not see the field as clearly and not want to take those chances. Um, all right, Justin, those are our matchups to watch. What are our keys to victory here? If you want, I can get started on this one. Key to victory for me, I sort of already hinted at it, so I won't spend too much time on it. It's protect the football. Will Levis leads the NFL with eight turnovers. The Titans have a very negative turnover differential. They haven't generated a turnover on defense. Their only takeaway came on the kick return that Velas Jones basically just said, here, Titans, take the ball. I don't want it anymore. Um, It wasn't even like they forced that fumble. He just muffed a kickoff. So the Titans defense has not generated any turnovers. The Titans offense is giving the ball away at a high rate. A key to me is finally win the turnover battle in a game and see how much better your chances of winning become. See if you're really competitive late in the fourth quarter in a game where you maybe win the turnover differential or at least don't lose it. At least keep it neutral. I mean, it's pretty straightforward, right? Everyone's going to say protect the football based on having the worst 
turnover margin in the NFL. So that's a, an obvious one. I'll give you another obvious one. Protect Will Levis, right? Do a better job up front. Quickly want to talk about the tackle situation. Uh, Brian Callahan benched Nicholas petit Friere in that last game. Uh, went with Jalen Duncan. Jalen Duncan came in, did not play well. I think the sad reality is that the Titans don't have an in-house solution to the right tackle spot. They just don't. Callahan said he was going to want to see both of those players in practice this week before making a decision. And then he followed that up with saying, maybe we'll see both of them, which I think is just a silly mistake. Mike Rabel did that once, right, where they swapped right tackles almost series by series. I think that would be silly. No one gets into a rhythm. I don't, I don't think it helps anyone. I understand why he might feel desperate, though, because this is not – a good situation, and the sad reality is they don't have a solution, but we'll see what happens there at right tackle. Protect Will Levis is my key to victory. Force a damn turnover. Take care of the football on your end, and I'll give you something a little bit different. Affect the quarterback. You know, they didn't do a good enough job uh, when they faced the backup quarterback in Malik Willis last week. Gave him too much time, too, too comfortable. I mean, his average time to throw was low. I should add to that, but they just didn't do enough to make him uncomfortable, especially as a runner. You know, he had so much success on the ground game. So certainly a bit of a concern there. You got, whether it's Skylar Thompson, Snoop Huntley, Tim Boyle, whoever the hell it is, you've got to do a better job affecting that pocket than you did uh, Malik Willis. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Those are great keys to see if the Titans can pull them off. All right, Justin, before we bring in our guest, let's hit our sponsored segment. I'll drink to that. Brought to you by Sinkers Beverages in East Nashville. My dad keeps texting me that we need to get real drinks for this segment. He's like, holding up a air miming glass is not working. Just even if it's water, get a drink. Um, and I, I am not doing it, so sorry, Dad. Um, but thanks for being a loyal viewer of the Music City Audible, even though you're not a Titans fan. All right, Justin. Thanks for uh, encouraging your son to drink, even though I, he did say you could drink water too, but. <laughs> I'll drink to that, Justin. What are you drinking to this week, or do you want me to go first? <laughs> You know, I'd like to avoid an 0-4 start, right? I think I'm going to keep yeah. it pretty simple. I'd like to avoid, avoid the 0-4 start. They're 0-3 for the first time since 2009. It would be 0-4 since the first time since 2009 because they went, what, 0-6 that year, I think? But uh, you'd like to avoid the 0-4 start. And next week, I'm drinking to the fact that I would like to come on here and say – We're not questioning whether they're going to make this quarterback change or not. We want to see Will Levis play a good game and remove those questions from our brain, right? We we want to see Will Levis play well and stop wondering if Brian Callahan's going to yank him. So I'm drinking to a good performance from Will Levis. I still have a little bit of hope that he can get there, get where he needs to go. Uh, I'm drinking to a good Will Levis show. I like that. I am drinking to the fact that the Titans may be 0-3, but so are the Jacksonville Jaguars. And while the Titans situation does not look good right now, it is a rainbow and sunshine situation compared to what Jacksonville is dealing with. They paid their quarterback $275 million. He looks as bad as Will Levis, maybe? Maybe not that bad, but pretty much as bad as Will Levis. There are questions about if they're going to fire the head coach, Doug Peterson. There was the quote circulating in the internet that Shad Khan said to his team in a meeting before the season started that this is the best Jaguars team ever assembled, the best players, the best coaches. Now let's prove it by going out and winning. Uh, they haven't won uh, any of Trevor Lawrence's last eight starts. So yeah, things are bad in Nashville, but look around the division. Things are bad in Jacksonville. Things are not great in Indy, even though they got a win against a, what's probably a pretty bad Bears team. And uh, the Texans got pretty much blown out by the Vikings. So you look across the division, it's like, is AFC South good? They were supposed to be an exciting division with a bunch of young, exciting quarterbacks, and now they're just the worst division in football again. The AFC South, as a division, is 2-8. and eight. Both of those wins came against the Bears. The only team <laughs> that's played the Bears in the division that didn't beat them... Well, that's your Titans. Um, so that's what I'm drinking too, is that the Titans may be bad, but they're not the only bad team in the division. And that was I'll Drink to That by brought to you by Sinkers Beverages, the premier wine, spirits, and beer store in East Nashville, serving the community since 1985. Their knowledgeable staff is proud to help you with large parties, themed events, or finding something unique for a special occasion. From birthday parties to milestone celebrations to everyday moments, Sinkers can help with the right drink for every occasion. If you head to sinkersbeverages.com or check the link in this podcast description, you can join the in crowd. In-crowd members get access to allocated wines and spirits, exclusive events, early access to barrel releases, and more. 
All right, Justin, I think we covered the game from our side. Let's get to our guest. On the other side of that, we'll do our game predictions for this week, so don't go anywhere. But now I think it is time to bring in our guest. Travis Wingfield covers the Dolphins, actually works for the Dolphins, a writer for MiamiDolphins.com, host of the Drive Time Podcast, which is part of the Dolphins Podcast Network, and... Am I allowed to say a fan and a listener of Heed the Call? Travis, welcome to the show. You're damn right. You can say that grave digger. I mean, I'm, I've been a, a <laughs> oh, day wait. one listener. Not not day one. I should say I found around the NFL back in 2016, kind of when I found out about podcasting myself. And that's when I really jumped into it. And, you know, at first I was like, this isn't enough football talk for me. I was one of those guys. And then as time went on, I'm like, this is by far the most entertaining podcast in in the landscape of podcasts, much less sports media. And so I just fell in love with the guys. And then I thought it was at its best when you were producing the show, Graver. And now I'm so, so happy after, you know, I was really sad, man. Like I was genuinely sad when the show went off the air. And then when I heard they were coming back with you at the, at the helm, let's go, baby. It's been fun to hear you guys get back together on the podcast. Well, I really appreciate it, Travis. We're happy to be back. And we're really glad to have you on today to talk Titans, Dolphins, two teams that maybe didn't get off to the start of the season that we were expecting, but uh, still could be an interesting matchup here on Monday Night Football. Yeah, man. Uh, it's It's been like a, a week and a half of like perspective searching kind of because I, I was telling friends this. Like I grew up a Dolphins fan, so I've been a fan of this team my entire life. And we went like 20 years without – much fun. Like we didn't have no playoff success. There was never top offenses, which I know you guys are, are very well uh, understanding how that works nowadays and how boring it can be when you don't have top offense. And then to get a team that was good for a couple of years and didn't get the results they wanted. It feels like we had that little brief taste of the success that we all yearn for, for so long. And it's a long year. We'll see what happens with Tua's health and when he returns, but to have it kind of snatched away and with, within the first two weeks and to put the performance out, they put against the Seahawks. I mean, it it's tough. It's been a tough, a tough couple of weeks here, man. Yeah, yeah. no doubt about it. And I, I kind of want to talk about the first performance, Travis, without Tua. You know, that's where we're going to start. The offense struggled, to say the least. You know, one of 15 combined on third and fourth down, 65 net rushing yards, just 140 net passing for a 205 total. Uh, a, and this might be the, the, the simple part of the question, but what did you see sort of from the offense without Tua and B, did you expect Mike McDaniel to maybe do a better job scheming around the quarterback? And the reason I ask that is because we saw it here in Tennessee last week, unfortunately, where they played the Green Bay Packers, who did a phenomenal job, you know, scheming around Malik Willis, put up 30 points uh, on the Titans. So a bit of a two-part question, but what did you see there? And did you think they would maybe do a bit of a better job? Yeah, I think it's sometimes kind of a cop out to say if we had QB one, we would have won that game. But I think that was I think that was the case in this one because the defense, I mean, there the Seahawks had like five drives in a row that produced like negative yards. And one of the one that had positive yards was an interception. Uh, I think it was from Zach Sealer. And the offense just couldn't pay it off ever. They couldn't move the ball. They got the ball at the six yard line on one drive and only got a field goal out of it there. So it was just frustration on top of frustration. And the reason I think that Tua would have been the difference in the game was because they had those same routes that you've seen him hit time and time again, you know, with Tyreek Hill and those like 18 yard in breakers, those dig routes, that dagger concept, the stuff that they love to run, the glance, the little slants, all the things they hit in the middle of the field with that timing and rhythmic passing game. And, it's it's just so crazy to me the dichotomy between Tua and Skylar Thompson because Tua is and for my money the the best quick release passer in the entire National Football League maybe one of the best of all time with how quickly he sees it and gets it out uh, when it's when it's there for him and Skylar just holds the ball man like you see it in the stats that the next gen stats Tua is like two point three seconds time to throw and Skylar was like over three his rookie year I I kind of understood that but the third year coming back it was it was the same if not worse in terms of seeing guys open, not anticipating it, opening up, and just kind of trying to play from there. And that's that's just not going to work in this offense. And so to your point about changing things, it, it didn't really change. It was kind of the same game plan, and that's where I kind of hoped it would be. And my hope was that Skyler would be able to elevate his game to match what this system does because – I mean, you know, we're we're less than 12 months removed from everyone saying that Mike McDaniel's this cutting edge innovator that the rest of the league is copying everything that he does. And so I have a hard time believing that within 12 months, that's out the window completely. But I do think that now after one game, one proof of concept, 
Who the hell knows who starts the game on Monday night, but I have to imagine it looks different for that one. I don't think it was for the Seahawks game. See, you mentioned it there as if you knew what my second question was going to be already. I was going to ask you about who you think is going to start on Monday night. So Mike McDaniel, you know this, but our listeners probably don't. Mike McDaniel said Tuesday, Skylar Thompson is day-to-day. He indicated that they might go with any of the three backup quarterback options. Thompson, Tim Boyle, Snoop Huntley, who was acquired uh, from the Ravens practice squad, signed, what, last Tuesday, I believe. So do you have any gut feeling or even just a guess on who you think is going to start in this game? I'm going to guess Huntley just because of watching the tape and what my eyes tell me and that he's pretty, pretty substantially the best option on the roster, in my opinion. Now, the caveat to that is, like you mentioned, Justin, he got here, we're t- talking on a Wednesday here, he got here eight days ago. This offense, yeah. again, is is not easy. It's one of the more complex offenses. It's one of the more heavy verbiage offenses. Now, granted, I think playing at home is an advantage with that kind of mindset because you don't have the, I mean, the Lumen Field crowd was crazy in that game on Sunday. So that was, a, you guys saw it. It was a major issue getting plays in and out of the huddle and getting to the line of scrimmage and getting guys lined up and all the shifts in motion. It was just like 60 minutes of panic and chaos is kind of how I felt it through the, through the TV mm-hmm. screen. But I think that even with Huntley's minimal experience in the offense, the fact that he can, like, I, I watched a bunch of his throws, actually all of his throws throughout the course of this week. And it's like, he can spot where blitzers come from and replace the football, the blitz with the football, throw those quick hookups over the top of the football and like just be on time and in rhythm and one hitch and get the ball out, which this offense is not designed to true drop back pass over and over again. This, this system is built upon, you know, horizontal stretch displacement and create, uh, you know, indecision for the defensive line to make their pass rush tougher to get after the quarterback. And then Tua's skill set obviously, you know, amplifies that times 10. But I think yeah. for Hunley, where he can kind of change that for Huntley, Huntley can kind of change that for you is number one, he sees it better, I think. But number two is obviously the athletic ability. And, you know, I was looking back at the history of this Shanahan system. They tried it with Trey Lance. Obviously it didn't work at all, but they just never really have had like back to Jake Plummer, I think is the, the best example you can give of a quarterback that had real like running gusto to his game on top of what the scheme is. And I'm, I am slightly intrigued by that with Huntley, even if it is eight days of knowledge in the playbook or whatever, whatever it is. Um, I think that with, you know, Tyreek on jet sweeps or Waddle and the rounds and what Devon A. Chan can do, the factor of the quarterback being able to pull the ball out of the belly of those guys and keep it around that backside that's what has me intrigued for this game from the Dolphins' offensive perspective. So that's why I go Huntley, but I, I really don't know. Yeah, I I think that makes the most sense. And I mean, so one thing that stood out to me looking, I was just looking through the insights on NFL Pro. Great new, great new thing that Next Gen Stats and the NFL have come out with here is the NFL Pro. But one thing that jumped out to me was the motion rate from this uh, game at uh, in Seattle. Skylar Thompson and Tim Boyle at quarterback. Dolphins utilized motion at the third lowest rate of the Mike McDaniel era, which was still 75%. So it's still higher than like most teams are using Crazy. motion. <laughs> um, but the fact that it dropped, I always thought that the motion thing, like in addition to just throwing off a defense's keys and whatever, helps the quarterback read, like, is this man coverage or zone coverage? Like, that's the most basic use of motion in the NFL. It's weird that they drop that when you bring in the backup quarterback, but I do feel like if Huntley is the quarterback and you start implementing some more QB rollouts where he can run with his legs if the throw's not there, some read option or designed QB runs that you could see motion implemented that way. Um, do you think that this is what? Do you think there's any particular reason, or is this a weird outlier for the motion rate being so low last week? Yeah, I think the outlier is. Uh, if you go back and watch the game live, like they were consistently getting out of the huddle late. And so I kind of wonder if sometimes mm. they were urged to just like get to the line of scrimmage and call it static as is, because I mean, the whole first quarter, McDaniel was like hanging out by the ref, like doing, doing like the, you know, am I going to call a timeout? And then they wouldn't do it. They get the snap off and they would run from there. And it was just consistently disjointed, man. Like we'd see that the, the guard would come off the snap at a different time than the tackle. And then the, the F would be a different time than that. And then the quarterback and running back would bump into each other on the mesh. Like it was just consistently not a clean operation. And so I, I'd, I'd be curious to hear the splits on that because I don't know, Graver, what, what those numbers looked like quarter to quarter, but I think that they had to make an adjustment because the first quarter was like just getting the snap off was an issue the entire first quarter. So that might have had something to do with it. 
It's funny. I want to go back just a little earlier because Travis, I, I do think this is going to be Snoop Huntley as well. I, I agree with what you said. By far the best option they have. In fact, Jeffrey Simmons, Titans defensive lineman, spoke with the media, I believe it was earlier today on Wednesday, and essentially said they're preparing for Huntley. Like They, they feel pretty good that it's going to be Huntley. So thought that was interesting. Was Of course, the head coach was a little more reserved, said they're preparing for all three of them. But uh, I want to move to the run game a little bit here. Uh, you know, didn't have a lot of success against the Seahawks, 2.7 yards per carry. I'm going to guess that has a lot to do with Seattle selling out to stop the run, you know, based on the quarterback situation. But when you take a deeper dive into the analytics this season, uh, Devon Achan has forced 18 missed tackles this year. That's fourth most in the entire NFL, no matter who the quarterback is. Uh, and the Titans, they've been susceptible to runs on the edge, by the way. They've done a pretty good job up the middle. But if you could win the edge and the guy with his speed, I think that's potentially an area of strength for the Dolphins in this game. How important is it for them to get going? And what did you think the Seahawks did to keep them contained? Yeah, I think they they flooded the outside part of the field. And one thing that has been a an issue for the Dolphins in the running game, like the, the offensive line gets like so much crap from the fan base. And it was a, a point of contention all off season. But every time I watch the film, man, like they're, they're doing a pretty good job where I think they're losing a lot of the gaps in the running game is at the tight end position. I just think they're not doing a good job sealing off the edges and teams are also overplaying to defend that because that's in the entire crux of this offense. As I'm sure you guys know now with a, a disciple of a disciple of the Shanahan tree that you want to set up the outside, <laughs> zone game and then create overplay and attack off of that overplay and what we've seen from the overplay defenses I've given the Dolphins offense is some space inside and they actually have adapted to a little bit more man gap scheme inside and you can screenshot like the, the tight copy from the back from the end zone angle on a lot of these Dolphins inside runs when they are going power and gap and you know they're pulling Liam Eikenberg's butt out of there a lot of times and he's hitting these blocks at the second level and you see these Mack truck lanes that are just open up for guys like A-Chan Wright and most of when he was healthy back in week one and I, I think that that's where you have to find your running lanes to I guess maybe condense the field a little bit more for the defense and not get them out on the edges I'm sure uh, Kenneth Murray is looking forward to running to the numbers every single play in the game on, on Monday night and using his speed to get out there and make those plays and so I think number one is just the ability to to do both of those things would be great but also without Tua you know the inability to capitalize on what that horizontal stretch does for the intermediate passing game in the middle part of the field like two is just so good at that and when you take that away I think it creates less conflict for the linebackers who can now just pin their ears back and run to the edge and not be as worried about the football going back over their head to Tyreek Hill which you don't want that to happen right that's that's where big plays come so I think it's the loss of Tua the edge hasn't been as good in the blocking game and uh, teams have really committed to stopping the outside run Interesting. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. Um, we'll see if the Titans can contain Achan in this one. Uh, like Melo said, they've done a pretty good job containing runs up the middle, but struggled containing runs to the outside, especially if you implement a QB rushing element there if Huntley does get the start. So we'll see that. Let's look at, we talked a lot about the Dolphins offense. Let's flip to the other side of the ball here. So the Titans have been allowing pressure at the highest rate in the league. Will Levis has been pressured on 47% of his dropbacks. The Dolphins are generating pressure at a pretty good clip, above average clip, 11th highest rate in the league per next-gen stats at 36.6%. Should Titans fans be worried, or maybe I should phrase it this way, how worried should Titans fans be about Jalen Phillips and Calais Campbell and I know Ogba's out and Bradley Chubb's still out, but the rest of that Dolphins pass rush wrecking this game? Yeah, I'd be curious to hear your guys' take on the guard and center play because I, I've read a couple of conflicting things. And watching the tape, it seems like that's where the, the pressures come off the right side. Is that kind of the, the majority of them come off that right side? I mean, you mentioned Jalen yeah. Phillips, uh, Nicholas petit Frere. if I'm saying that right. I know that's not a great matchup for the Titans' perspective. I think that's where Miami can kind of can get after them on that spot. Now, the Seahawks did a good job on JP because they had their third-string right tackle in the game, and they kind of fanned out and slid protection that way. But what that did was create a bunch of one-on-ones for, like you mentioned, Calais Campbell and Zach Sealer, who is just, my God, he is such a good football player. I think that he still, to this day, is not getting enough credit for how good he is. He had some, he had wins. We did a breakdown for the, the Dolphins YouTube show this week, Dolphins HQ. Check it out, Dolphins YouTube channel. Um, taking a look at Zach Sealer's, we took it took a look at three plays where he he won from the one technique, the three technique, and the five technique with just pure power and length and strength. He is so much fun to watch. And so I'd be curious to hear your guys' take. And we'll, we'll do this on drive time, I guess, with Skaronsky and, and Radens about how they handle power because Campbell and Sealer 
I mean, it might be the most powerful defensive tackle combination in the league. And I say that talking to two guys that watch Jeffrey Simmons and Tavondre Sweat every single week. So those two guys with their power have really kind of forced teams to to squeeze their protection, and that should help create some chances off the edge. Uh, you mentioned, you know, JP, He's he had a good first game, but I think he's kind of working back still. Uh, you know, he's, he's 10, 11 months removed from an Achilles uh, tear surgery, and he's – He's playing a bunch of snaps. So that's great. But I think he's still working back to getting that explosiveness. And then off the other edge, Chop Robinson hasn't gotten home yet, but he's been close a lot. And I know that's probably your best tack, your be- best player on the line with J.C. Latham. So we'll, that'd be a good matchup to watch. But I think that Campbell and Sealer's power inside is where the biggest issues from the Dolphins pass rush comes right now. And then they run those two fast linebackers, Jordan Brooks and David Long, off of that, which what you guys know with this uh, former Ravens system that Anthony Weaver runs, mugged up linebackers, rushing those linebackers frequently. So it's a nice combination of power up front and speed to the second level. Interesting. Yeah, I think the biggest concern for Titans fans in this game is how can they protect Will Levis? We did our keys to the game before we brought you on and Mellows was to protect Will Levis. So that's a huge part of this game. But one way they can take some pressure off of Will Levis is by running the football. And if you just look at the raw numbers, it feels like the Dolphins have been pretty good against the run. But if you look closer, Zach Charbonnet, not a super talented guy by his like success rate and broken tackles force and all those advanced running back metrics. Had a pretty dang productive game against Miami on not that many carries. I think he had 19 carries. Um, And then the week before that, it felt like the Bills really controlled the game by running it, even though, again, the raw stat, it's not like they ran for 190 yards, but um, it seemed like they controlled the game. Is that an area you think the Titans should try to maybe exploit, or do you think the Dolphins are better against the run than maybe what my perception of it is? I think it's probably somewhere in between that. I was actually putting my preview notes together before I came on the show with you guys and saw the Titans were one of the bottom teams in terms of yards before contact, but one of the top teams after contact, which put my keys to the game to get 11 hats to the football and tackle these guys. And that's true for Will Levis, too. Don't let him escape and and make the big plays because the explosive plays have been kind of what has made that offense go when it has gone, right? So, uh, yeah, I think that... uh, the, the run defense, it's it's been a couple of gaffes that have caused big runs that have really produced those numbers, I think. Like James mm-hmm. Cook had that 49-yard touchdown run, and we went back and watched that on tape. It was like at the snap, you're like, oh, shoot. Like that, they are not – they're not fit. They have, they don't have the the hats to to fit this run right now uh, to the gaps they have to the strength of the formation. And sure enough, they got a, like a triple team on a defensive tackle, and that turned into a combination block. And he, they, there was no chance to stop that run because they were just outfit in the way it lined up. Um, I, it didn't feel like the Seahawks really got after the Dolphins in the running game, like just from a, a you know feel perspective. Um, they had the one big explosive pass play, a couple of drives they kind of controlled things. But other than that, the Dolphins really did a good job of holding them down. So I think that it's been the, the Jags game. The Jags ran the ball really well. Tank Bigsby kind of got after us in that one. But um, by right. and large, I think it's just been a couple of, of misfit gaps. And I would probably chalk that up more to – uh, a, a bunch of new players in a new scheme because we have a new linebacker with Jordan Brooks, Clayus Campbell's new, just trying to get things, you know, sort of from a, a, a newness perspective. So I think that it's somewhere in between. I think they've, they've had some success, but there have been some, you know, some misfires that have caused, you know, big plays from the opposing offenses. Right. Yeah, no doubt about it, Travis. We're really looking forward to Monday's matchup. Uh, we really appreciate you for joining us today. In closing, we typically do this with all of our guests. If you can give us a prediction, whether that's game flow, if you feel inclined, who's going to win the game, what the final score might be, exactly how many kicks does each kicker – no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> fi- final score, game flow prediction, hit us with what you got. <laughs> you know, again, to go back to the intro here, like, gosh, man, I watched so much bad offense for so long, and I thought I was out of that. I thought I was going to be you know, a, a fan of a team that just consistently put up 28, 35 points a game. And I just made so did we. So- <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> It just makes me so sad to say this. Like, I feel like you're going to get one of these like 16 to 10 games. And I, you know, I have a a rooting interest, so I guess it makes it fun that way. But those are the kind of football games where I'm like, I'll, I'll watch, you know, Dark Matter, or I'll go watch uh, Bad Monkey, an Apple TV show or something like that, you know. And so uh, I think it's going to be a a slug it out game. I will take the Dolphins if Huntley starts like 16 to 10. I think they can make this ugly and muddy it up, run the ball and and incorporate the quarterback run game and get that win. If it's not Huntley, I'll go like 17 to 6 Titans. Wow. Okay. Uh, No spoilers, but your 16 to 10 prediction is Pretty close to mine. Um, all right, Travis, we really appreciate your time here. You sort of mentioned it, but you didn't really mention it. Justin and I are going to do your pod now. So if you, uh, 
are a Titans fan that can't get enough of us. I don't know. That, that would be cool if you can't get enough of us. I don't, I'm not ego statistical enough to think that that's the case but we will be on travis's podcast and uh make sure you go find and follow travis on twitter at wingfield nfl he'll be tweeting out stuff during this game from the dolphin sides if you want that go follow travis and travis thanks again we will talk to you in a few minutes here i think (laughs) yeah sounds good gregory you can't have a big ego because uh the host of your show with nine nicknames self uh, self self-given has a big enough ego for the entire show so that's good on you man thanks boys that's fair that's fair all right Thanks, Travis. All right. Thanks again to Travis for joining us and giving us his insights into the Dolphins. Justin, let's get to our game predictions. We're going to wrap up the show here. And before we get to them, let's just review where we're at right now. So heading into last week, you were 2-0. I was 0-2. We both predicted a Titans win. Ouch. You had them 19-13. I had 23-13. So you're going to get the victory for this. I mean, I feel like we both should take an L. But that's not really how this works. If we're actually having like a competition, we got to say who was closer. And I had the Titans winning by 10. You only had them winning by 6. They lost by, what, 26? So I guess you were closer. So you'll take the 3-0 they lead lost by 16. on me. They lost by 16. 16, but, sorry. Uh, Math is yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think we should just both have losses. But anyway, I'll get to mine. I mean, I think I was mostly positive for this episode. But I'm going to end on a bit of a gloomy note uh, I'm in see it to believe it mode, you know, and don't have a lot of confidence in this team's ability yet. They haven't been able to pull out a win quite yet. Uh, I'm going with another loss. I, I think it's going to be Snoop Huntley, which we briefly talked with our guest, talked about with our guest. I think it's going to be Snoop Huntley. I think he gives them some trouble like Malik Willis did last week. In fact, Jeffrey Simmons said that, by the way. Uh, Jeffrey Simmons said we're preparing like it's Snoop Huntley and, you know, he can do some things Malik Willis did. I think he's a competent quarterback. Uh, I, I think he is. I think Miami's he's a, a pro better bowler. overall roster. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's a pro bowler. But, yeah, he's a, I think he's a competent backup quarterback. Seeing the issues Malik Willis gave them, I, I, I think he's able to get the Dolphins this win at home. I'm going Dolphins 23, Titans 17. Okay, so you have the t- Titans scoring 17 again for the third time in uh, in four games. Look, I watched the Dolphins Seahawks game last week, and yeah, maybe Snoop Huntley gives them a leg up over Skylar Thompson or Tim Boyle, and uh, maybe I'm just an idiot here. For you know, if you do something over and over again expecting different results, you're insane, according to Albert Einstein. I'm going to predict a Titans win here because I just, the Dolphins offense, first of all, the Dolphins offense didn't even look good when Tua was healthy. They haven't looked, they looked like the December Dolphins in September this year. Um, So that's one aspect of this. And the other aspect is like, can the Titans really have the bad turnover luck for a fourth straight game? Probably if Will Lewis is your quarterback, but hopefully they can avoid that and beat a backup. Like, can you just beat a backup quarterback, please, Titans? So for that reason, I'm going to go Titans 16 Dolphins 13. I still don't think that the offense really gets moving. Still don't think that they are going to be a high powered unit on that side of the ball scoring touchdowns left and right. This is not the uh, end of the 30 point drought for the Titans, I don't think, but I will give them a win. Titans 16, Dolphins 13. And uh, I don't know, man. I just, if, if they can't beat a backup quarterback and a Dolphins team that struggled with their starter, where do we even go from here? I mean, you're going with the win. I love that you're staying with the positivity. I'm going with the loss. We'll see what happens. But thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, I think this was a much better episode than the Packers reaction one. A lot more in-depth analysis. We're going to keep that going, especially with the Dolphins recap. No matter what happens, y'all stay safe out there and tighten up. Wait, before you sign off, Justin, sorry to cut you off. We will be back Monday night, not on Sunday, because this is a Monday night game. So set your notifications, subscribe to the channel. Thanks to Sinkers Beverages. Thanks to everyone. And yes, we'll be back Monday night. So, okay, Justin, you can say it now. (laughs) Y'all stay safe out there and tighten up. A Broadway Sports Media Production.